Welcome back to Switzer on Australia's Business Channel. Our next guest is regarded as one of the best stockbrokers in the country and a raging share market bull. He is, of course, Charlie Aiken, the MD of Bell Potter Wholesale. Charlie Aiken's here to tell us how he's advising his clients on the Westfield deal, give us his thoughts on the confession season, the market, and what he's buying right now. Mate, welcome to the show. Thanks, Marty. I think raging bulls a tiny bit out of date. Oh, well, you know. We have toned things down a little bit recently. Yeah, fair enough. Just a little bit. Never, let, let, the truth, never so. let the truth get in the way of a good yarn. <laughs> um, so the Iraq situation. We had Michael on the show then. You might have caught a bit of it. I did. Let's just continue on from that. What is your view on the Iraq situation well, and what impact it will have on markets? Well, it's a funny one, Marty, because it's always something left field that comes out and just derails markets. Before last week, no one had heard of ISIS. No one had even put a thought to Iraq. The oil price had been very steady, around 100 bucks in America for quite a while. And then, you know, in markets, volatility has been very low. Volume has been low. And there's just always something that comes out of left field. I think Michael could be right. I think the Brent oil price is the thing to keep an eye on. Yeah. Obviously, the more European sort of um, Middle Eastern oil price. If it does spike to 125, 126, that is probably enough in the current environment to trigger a little bit of a pullback in markets. There's no mm -hmm. doubt. Markets were not prepared for that. And it's just something that, again, we're in that seasonally weak period for equities too. Five of the last five years, between May and August, the market has fallen, globally and locally. It could happen again this year. We're already down a little bit in June. And actually, what, another thing people forget, Marty, the market in Australia is exactly where it was nine months ago. We've actually gone sideways for nine months. Yeah. So You don't buy the, the term grinding higher? It feels like we've been grinding sideways. No, I think it's, it's been grinding it out. I mean, it hasn't been a great return. It's been a stock picker's market. That's a cliche. Yep. But picking stocks is how you've added value and avoiding th avoiding stocks is how you've added value. It's been very divergent stock performance. This little episode in Iraq, you know, Michael has made a good point. It's at the same time as there's pressure in the Ukraine as well. Mm. It's a scenario where oil prices could go quite a lot higher. That could be enough to upset the market. So what are the drivers now, if we can get past this Iraq issue, and hopefully we can, what are the drivers that can take the market higher for the rest of the We've year? We've got to see some earnings growth. I mean, look, yep. there's only so far yield compression can get us, Marty. Yep. You know, look, you know, banks are at record highs, Telstra's at a 10-year high, dividend yields have been bid down and down and down. I don't think dividend yield can take us from here. Mm. It's nice, it probably underpins the market at a point, but you need to see some earnings growth. But I don't mean um, cost-out-driven earnings growth. We need to see some top-line revenue growth. You're yep. starting to see it in America, and that's why the American share market's outperforming the world. Mm. American companies are actually starting to grow at the top line. They were the first to bring in ultra-cheap money, and they'll be the first to exit ultra-cheap money. And the American economy's actually going pretty well. Mm. And But... I would be looking for hopefully some revenue growth in the second half of year, but it's a bit tricky because in Australia right now, there's a lot of companies warning on earnings because the post-budget... So we've got confession down. season now? Yeah, it's happening again and today, uh, Super Auto Group. Yep. Shares are up because they'd fallen 20% into the announcement. But again, another retailer saying things are pretty tough. And, and you think that's budget-related, consumer confidence-related? Because there's been reports, you know, Deloitte came out today saying that, you know, retail sales uh, will be strong this year as they will next year on the back of, you know, low interest rates. Look, um, it's a tricky rising one. house prices. I mean, everyone looks for an excuse and the budget, you know, no offence to the government, the budget's been poorly sold. Yep. Whoever's doing the spin on the budget has done it very badly. It's, it seems that it, just about everyone in the entire population thinks they're worse off. Mm. Well, that's probably not the outcome. Yep. So I don't think that's helped. I think we can get through that. But if you talk to any retailer, May, May combined with some unseasonal weather, was terrible. Yeah. Like activity did drop off the cliff. Yep. You can see in these profit warnings from discretionary retailers, they're big, mm. quite big profit warnings. Mm. But Look, I think later in the year, house prices are still firm, interest rates are still low, the share market's going along, the, budget's, the budget's off the heads line. Look, there's a chance retail sales can come back. But in the meantime, I'd just be hiding in the grocery retailers. I think they're a better place to hide. So before we go to uh, Westfield, I do want to talk yep. about that. Uh, just stay on confession season. Do you think any of the other major plays in the consumer discretionary stocks, your Myers and whatnot, could come out with some confessions? Well, it's, it's pretty much it's assumed now in the market that everyone's going to say something. I mean, all yeah. the share prices have been marked down, some quite sharply. Yeah. I think the other way, Marty, I think it's probably the people who service the, um, service the retail sector, maybe some of the transport stocks, some of the media stocks. Yep. You know, they've been pretty sloppy on the back of this too, you know. And I think anything that's East Coast cyclical, consumer facing, is just in that sloppy period where the market's worried they're going to confess that it's got a little bit worse. But that can come up, that can go all the way up to August, up to the full year results. Yep. And I think once we get some clarity at the full year results and some outlook statements, maybe it all stabilises, but a bit further to go though, I reckon. Oil price, that should hurt a few retailers too. You'd just a sentiment thing too, household budgets, you know, you can see again today fuel prices are up at the yep. pump, it just doesn't help. Yep. You know, people go, oh, the fuel price is up. It's just another reason not to spend. Not to spend. Yep. Okay, so uh, there's a big vote on June 20. You've yep. come out and you've uh, expressed some um, 
uh, strong and intelligent views, as you always do, in relation to the, the, the Westfield no, saga. <laughs> <laughs> what you think your clients should be doing. Can you give us the, well, I think I, there was... can you give, first a quick summary of the situation? Because I think a lot of people don't understand it. And then also what you think investors should do. It's, pretty, it's an interesting one because obviously the Lowy's put a proposal to um, vend the other half of the Westfield Australian and New Zealand assets that they own in Westfield Holdings into Westfield Trust at a, at a ratio that was deemed you know, fair so and reasonable. They don't own any of Westfield Retail Trust. They own none they? of Westfield Retail Trust but they own 50% of the assets that are the, and Westfield Retail Trust owns the other 50%. Yep. They own 8% of WDC. That's a little bit complicated to start with. Yep. The proposal was that they would simplify the structure. All the offshore assets would be in WDC, all the Australian assets would be in WRT. The, the Lowys end up owning 4% of both companies. There's a, there's, a, there's a capital return and a ratio and all this sort of thing we shouldn't bother getting into here. Yeah, yeah. The argument comes That's down... a new company called Centre. Yeah, Centre. It becomes uh, Westfield Corporation and Centre Group. Centre's the Australian one. Most people who look at it think it's fair enough. It's not, not the, the, the most you know, easy deal to analyse, or not the cheapest deal, or not the best deal or whatever, but it's, it, the independent experts claim it's fair and reasonable. Most commentators I've read believe it's fair and reasonable. The problem was, in the first vote, they needed 75% of the votes to go in their favour. They got 74.1 because a few institutions stood against it. That's fine. Institutions are allowed to have a view. They've got no problem with that. The reason I entered the debate was that a very large proportion of retail investors who own WRT did not vote. Mm. Now, I think this is something you need to vote in, one way or the other. I mean, I've advised my clients to vote it through because the Lowys put a different proposal together that said if it wasn't voted through, they would go it alone anyway. Mm -hmm. And they would create another company, probably called Newco, which would have their half of the Australian assets, and WRT would be left with their half of the Australian assets, paying management fees to the Newco. And the Lowys would own no percent of WRT. I said to our clients, I think that's an unfavourable outcome. If it gets voted... It becomes even messier, doesn't it? It gets messier. It just, it's just unnecessary. It's messy. And really, over the last 40 or 50 years, being aligned with the Lowys has been a very good thing. You want them in your shares. You want them managing the company. They turned a delicatessen in Liverpool into the world's biggest shopping centre owner in, in 40 years. That's absolutely mm. amazing. Mm. And look... I don't have a problem with the institutions and the minutiae of the deal and some of the things they're upset about and they bought an apple and got an orange and that's, that's a little bit of that's true. Mm. My point is that if you're a retail shareholder in WRT, you should vote one way or the other. Yep. Because if you look back and it doesn't happen and, the, and it gets voted down, the lowies leave you and don't own any of your shares and set up a sort of competitor, don't say you weren't told. And I think that's the bit I was trying to say to our shareholders. I think we have enough shares that in, inside our shareholder base that we could actually turn the vote. Yeah. They can make up their own minds, but I just think they should vote. And you're basically voting, in my simple summary, for a future with the Lowys or a future without the Lowys. Management. And I just said, well, I, I want to be aligned with the Lowys. Through time, that's worked well. They're very sensible. Mm. And we'll see how we go on Friday. The Fin Review is reporting that, that a couple of institutions have changed sides. And I think this will get through on Friday. Mm. And only just. And I think that it's also important that you know, anyone who owns WRT shares is watching this program, at least thinks about how they're going to vote, votes and gets their proxy form in by Wednesday. What was the issue that um, the uni supers and the, and the, the Stephen Mains of the world yeah, had it's about with the, the deal? Value. It's about the value of the development company that also come, and the value of the management rights. The Lowy sweetened the deal by $300 million. There's also issues about the gearing going from 23% of WIT to 37%, but then of course the WIT said they want to get the gearing back to 30-odd 2% by some asset sales. So A, the gearing of the vehicle being a little bit higher, and B, the value of the development development company rights and also the management company rights. But they're not hugely different from what people would agree with anyway. So the to, me it's, to me, it's close enough. Yeah. Yeah, but the other side of it, that part's close enough. I don't want to be invested in something that the Lowy's then have no part of and the management company is then paying uh, management fees back to the, the new company. So to me, there's a new element of downside has been introduced. That is why I got involved and that's why I'm recommending to our clients to accept the deal, vote in favour of the deal. Yeah and st stay aligned to the lowest because the alternative I don't think is attractive. And would the naysayers believe that the current proposal is not going to get them as good a return on their investment? They just think it's a different return on their investment, I think. I think yeah. Well, they bought a you know, mature Australian you know, and New Zealand property trust. The, it gets geared up a little bit more. I don't disagree with that. You can argue over the value of the management rights because they've been transferred from one to the other. But in my view, it simplifies both structures. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, if you ever want to get something taken over in the future, it's got to be simple and clean. It leaves it as, here's Westfield, basically America and the UK, here's Westfield, Australia, New Zealand. Someone can come along in the future and go, boom, yeah. take them both over. Yeah. It's easy to do. So, 
Look, it's not, it's not exactly perfect, but you, I, I thought it was important to tell people that it, is, it, it requires their vote, one way or the other. Yep. They're, they're their shares, they can vote how they like. Take action. But don't be apathetic, because this could end up being something that you didn't expect. Mm. Uh, David Jones, Woolworth, Solomon Liu. Um, <laughs> any view? Well, Solly's bought another 30 million shares today. Oh, no, uh, what was it? He bought, yeah, something like 30 million shares today by the look of things. So he's got close to 10 to 15% yeah, through derivatives. Now, the only person who knows what Solomon Liu is doing is Solomon Liu. I think you'll have to get him on the show, Marty. I think history will suggest that he potentially is spoiling in some way, and that's how the shares reacted yeah. after he bought the shares today. They yeah. fell. Okay. So people were thinking, well, maybe he is not going to accept There's something he wants out of this, or he just doesn't want it to happen. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that, that really and truly, the only person who knows that is, is Solly himself. Could he pose a serious threat to the takeover? Yeah, he could block it. He could. And Absolutely. But he couldn't could he afford to buy it himself? Oh, I don't think anyone thinks he's taking the whole thing over. I think most people think there's a chance he's blocking it. Yeah, which is similar to what he did with uh, uh, Country, Country Road. Country Road as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Look, he's played his cards well. He bought 30 million shares today by the most, you know, 100 million bucks worth of stock. That's not, nothing to be sneezed at. Yeah. But I, I doubt he wants to take it over. Iron ore and miners. Iron ore, yes. What's happening here? Iron ore's been trouble. I think, look, as simple as this, Marty, the iron ore supply response has arrived after, you know, 10 years. Yeah. It's arrived from Fortescue, BHP, Rio, Vale. At the same time, our Chinese demand has, you know, slowed a little bit. The other thing is the Chinese are inquiring... Better numbers came out of China, though, during the yeah, week. Yeah, but they're, they're different. They're not, they're not necessarily to do with iron ore. The, pro the property numbers weren't good, which probably yeah, bad Yeah, exactly. For iron ore. And also, yeah. there's also an inquiry into financing of iron ore and copper at the port of Qingdao, I can't even pronounce it which may suggest that the Chinese are trying to get traders out of the market. Look, I, look the iron ore price where it is now and the, and the Aussie dollar not giving any ground, it basically makes any low-grade iron ore or miner in Australia marginally profitable at best. Mm. Now, the share market's onto that. It's That's market. MG. You know, Fortescue, on our numbers, if, they, if, if $90 iron ore persisted and a $0.94 cent Australian dollar, it would make earnings per share of $0.16. Cents. The current consensus forecast is something like 60 So. No one thinks, no, at this moment in time, people don't think iron ore and the Australian dollar are going to stay here. But if they do, for, you know, for fiscal year 15, it's a very bad scenario. Yeah. But it needs monitoring because it's really, the supply has arrived. Most of these guys dig it out of the ground for 40 or 50 bucks. And we could be just watching the supply response. Simple as that. Before we go, last question, uh, ASX 200, year end, can we get to 6,000? Absolutely impossible without iron ore recovering, okay. in my view. You know, we, it's, it will be truly impossible. You'd need interest rates lower, you'd need the Australian dollar much lower, and you'd need iron ore to bounce. At this moment in time, I don't think it's possible because the iron ore has fallen further and harder than anyone thought possible yeah. it, it, previously. Look, I think, Marty, if we can just get through this period with a little bit of a pullback, a bit of stability, not too many more profit warnings, reasonably you know, flat interest rates for some time, the market can grind out, out the other side of August. But I'd be very surprised if we can get to 6,000. Charlie Aiken, thanks for your time. Thanks, Marty. After the break, a leading accountant will tell us what you need to do to get ready for tax time. Don't go away.